Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And tonight, we will be addressing a very important part of Zen teaching, which is energy. Everybody is interested in energy, whether you work for a nuclear power plant, or uh, just electricity, or anything that moves uh, atoms and electrons from one place to another. Also, we are interested in energy when we talk about our emotions, our thoughts, our lifespan, because sooner or later we feel that all it takes is energy. However long you want to live, whatever great accomplishment you wish to achieve, it takes energy. Now, in the Orient, they talk about three kinds of energy. One is something you are born with. In Korean, this is called Wongi or original energy. You can see this in children. Some children they are very acute and they are very dynamic and as early as possible they start moving, crawling around at great speed and destroy everything in their path. And most of us were like that. Uh, but we were not the same in that regard. We were all slightly different uh, in our speed, in our agility, in our virility, and that difference is actually called uh, your karma. Whatever mind you have, whatever speed of cognition and kinetics you have, is all different. So, we don't have an equal amount of one gi. We have our own mind, our own kinetics, and it varies from person to person. Sometimes we are a little slower, Sometimes we get tired more easily. Some of us need more sleep or less sleep. We are different in that regard. And uh, it is good to know that we are not the same at the very core of our energy level. The only thing that is identical within all of us is our Buddha nature. The ability to perceive this energy and somehow later change it. So one gi is something you can observe very early in us, human beings, also in animals. Not two cats are the same. They all move slightly differently. Uh, they all eat in different style. So, when this one gi becomes full and we are conscious who we are as uh, human beings, then we really start to walk on our path as an individual. This one gi is stored in three major areas of the body. One, is the skin. So when that changes, that's the most superficial change in the body that you can observe. And it's very quick, so you get angry very quickly, the skin gets red. When you get excited, it gets another type of red. Uh, you have some kind of emotional or cognitive change, sometimes you get this goosebumps. Okay? It's all a change of one gi, original energy, but at the skin level. Sometimes you, uh, you work out and your muscles get a little bit sore. Or uh, you eat bad food and your uh, stomach and in intestinal tracts get really tired and you feel weak. Suddenly your one gi is zapped because the internal organs and muscles, the second layer, second level of storing this energy, they got overexhausted very quickly. And the third is the most stable storage, is the bone marrow. The bone marrow is actually your emergency reserves and you barely touch that. We, we don't even notice it's there. And uh, these three areas of storing, storing one gi is uh, basically our whole energy system from skin through the interior organs and flesh and muscles and blood vessels down to the third, which is our bone marrow. What do we do with this? Basically, we use this for our own existence. That's what powers us to hear, to see, to taste, to smell, to touch, to think, remember, to have wonderful feelings or bad feelings. And uh, at the end of the day, we get exhausted, we get tired, or we get totally jazzed up or excited, depending on what we do. Either way, whether you feel positively affected or negatively affected, you use this energy. How do you replenish that? You replenish that by sleeping, 
in and eating most of the time and drinking. And you also replenish that at the mental level by acquiring and generating good thoughts, good emotions, good willpower, all kinds of things to keep you moving, to keep you motivated. But no matter how much you drink and eat and sleep, this one gi will be exhausted at some point in your life. And that happens, you die. All of us do. No one can fully recharge the batteries. It always goes back to 99%. Not more. And of course, while you're young, you don't notice this. But as you get older, and you get through your midlife crisis, and you have children and grandchildren, you notice that something irreversible is taking place, and we call that impermanence. Impermanence is the law that never ever lets your batteries to be recharged full. 99.9 .9 at first, and 99.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, and then as you go along in your life, you use your energy for a lot of things that I have just mentioned, and at some point, goodbye. Now this would look really bad if it was just about that. But let me talk about the second one, which is this world. We started with the individual. Let's look at this world. You see the blue sky, the houses, the cars moving, the trees growing, people walking. All this in three-dimensional space and one-dimensional time, with all the chemistry and the physics, in all, conclusively, is called Deigi, or Great Energy, in the Orient. This Deigi is what we tried to describe with the four and now three major interactions in physics. Strong, weak, electromagnetic, and gravitic. Gravity works whether you see it or not. Electricity works whether we are charged at this point or not. And uh, the strong and the weak work within atoms and between atoms, to be simple. This Deigi is actually what holds this universe together as you see it. That's why these laws of physics and chemistry, they have a very cohesive function. If it wasn't cohesive, if it was just arbitrary, then overnight this universe could change. But it doesn't change. It is governed and ruled by a set of laws combined as the Gi. This great energy lasts a lot longer than our own one Gi. It's very, very clear. So for a long time, practitioners wanted to connect to this and hop on this great train of, I wouldn't say eternity, but longevity, stability, greatness, and now we get to the ideals of many spiritual paths. So, what's the third one? There has to be some relationship there. The third one is what we call Kong Gi, or empty energy. That's your breath. When you combine your breath with the moment, then your connection to the universe is possible. We call that becoming one. So when you don't build a wall out of your thinking, your feelings, your reactive mind, then your Wongi, Kongi, and Deigi can combine. That means you and the universe become one. This oneness experience is the ultimate source of everything positive that we look for. But it's also the source of everything negative that we do not look for, but yet perform. So this kind of connection between the three is what we call Hapki, or unified energy. This kind of Hapki is what you notice in Hapki Do. That's what it relies on, but it is not the only one in the martial arts branches that rely on that. In Japanese, this is Aikido. So we are using this all the time, but we don't notice it. What we do notice is when we are separated from this great energy. That's when you feel isolated or locked up in your own little world, feeling either a maniac or depressed or good or bad, but you are separated from this great energy. And that's when we go into extremes. That's when we go very low, or very high, into a spin 
that can either be a great rise of something extraordinary or a tailspin of something very, very negative and destructive and disintegrating. When you meditate, it's not just a figure of speech when you talk about the middle way. Because becoming one with the universe, the experience of oneness at this energy level is completely linked to or even rephrased by this teaching of staying on the middle way or walking on the straight path of awakening. Why? The only hindrance between the universe and you, between Degi and Wongi, is your idea of self. And this idea of self, the false notion of ego, is the only misplaced thing we have in the universe. Everything else works perfect. Look at that. If we don't mess this up, this world works wonderfully. But if we have a correct view of ourselves, then we don't make so many mistakes. If we have a completely distorted view of who we are and what this world is, then we cannot connect to each other and we cannot connect to this world. That's why this oneness experience is so important and by now all of you know it, that we are all looking for this. We call this happiness, we call this enlightenment, we call this going to heaven. There are many names, but this oneness experience where the drop of water returns to the ocean and becomes the ocean, that's exactly what all human beings instinctively or consciously are looking for. And our direction is oftentimes misplaced. We don't know how to find this. So we are looking for this in the wrong place, just like we have the wrong self-image in our own ego, instead of experiencing our true nature. Because the nature of Wongi, Kongi and Degi combined is the same. If you are looking for something really important and essential, start with yourself. The essence of the universe and the essence of us humans is not different. That's why in the Orient, they started looking inwards and finding something essential beyond your thoughts, beyond your feelings, beyond impermanence, imperfection and interdependence. So many times we talk about consciousness, we talk about our thoughts and feelings, and that's the cognitive or emotive as aspect of our mind. It's like a tree with 10,000 branches. But where's the root of that tree? Then you turn this coin over and then you talk about energy, not just mind. And you find that is the differentiation of one and the same thing. Except we cannot name it, we cannot define it, we cannot quantify it, we cannot prove it, we cannot know it, but we can experience it. And this oneness experience is exactly what Zen and other paths of awakening is about. So then, if you attain it, what do you do with it? That's the question. First of all, if you truly attain this one point, when you're thinking, your feelings, your notion of self, they're just all gone, then you see clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, think, taste, etc. very clearly, and then your path of helping others, helping this world, will all open up. And don't think that makes you into a special missionary. No. In fact, you will become less noticeable in everyday life from the outside, and your path on the inside will become clear moment to moment. So just by your everyday life, just by the examples you set, just by the simple action, simple speech, clear thoughts, sincere feelings, you can help and teach people. Something you will notice inside that your sense of identity completely changes. What you think you are and who you think you are will be gone. And the notion of this moment and yourself connected, that will arise. And uh, what you will also notice that your feelings, your thoughts, your speech and your actions they will start going to the same direction when you transcend your own wall, your own hindrances, 
then the notion of prefixed ideas will be gone. The prefixed ideas of good and bad, the orthodox and dogmatic views on life and death will be gone. And then you will see the world and yourself as it is. Because you got down to the job of looking inwards and finding out who you truly are instead of what you think you are. And this state of mind is what we call suchness. In Sanskrit, tathata. So this stick is neither long nor short. It's just like this. A person is neither good nor bad, but one has a beard and another one doesn't. We call this like this, or in Sanskrit, tathata, which gets rid of the dualistic ideas as the foundation of our lives and deaths. So we find something deeper, clearer, simpler than our dualistic ideas. We do not discard distinctive mind. So we will distinguish between the window and the floor, between the chair and the person, between night and day. But we will not make any judgments based on these distinctions. And if you look at your own personal history or cultural history or history of civilizations, almost exclusively when we started to make judgments instead of clear distinctions, we went wrong. We created suffering. We created conditions that we never wanted to live with later, starting from conflicts down to wars. So it's really important to see the world as it is, but we have to begin with ourselves to see ourselves as we are. And this is why when we start doing meditation, some of you have experienced this today, and some of you will be experiencing it tomorrow. We start with a very non-conventional technique. And that's what I termed in the afternoon as look inside and see, perceive. In the Buddha's time, this was called vidya. Later in Latin, videre. Even later, video. So first, be ready to watch your own video. This is not something you borrow from the corner store. Much more intense. But in fact, you are not interested in the video itself only. You are interested in the actors, then the director, then the projector, then the light that makes this projection possible. So if you really see as is, in its suchness or thusness, then you are never separate from the truth. And the essence of this truth is this oneness and clarity that I have spoken about. It's very simple. But just to think about it is insufficient. Even to feel it in your heart, as some of you do right now, is insufficient. To experience it actually starts you on the right path. But constantly keeping your direction clear, constantly keeping your path straight, that is what gives you the continued experience of oneness in this world, which seems to be made up of opposites. Our experiences of good and bad, happiness and unhappiness, uh, having everything and then having nothing, having a lot of friends, then no friends, then lots of enemies, then no enemies. This is just changing all the time. So what is it that's not changing? What is it that never breaks? What is it that always remains as it is? That's the experience that correct meditation practice and correct awakening can give you. This is why in Zen, we do not depend on the scriptures. We have scriptures, you all know that. But we do not depend on them as the source of our own experience. It's like a guidepost. It's like a user's manual to a product. And we directly point to human mind. Directly ask, what is this that sees with my eyes? What is this that hears with my ears? What is this that smells with my nose? What is this that tastes with the mouth and the tongue? So where does this consciousness come from? What is the source? When we do that, we get closer and closer to reality as it is. And what is really strange, that you do not need anything from the outside to wake up. 
So the definition of awakening is fully attaining your true nature. There is no other attribute. You don't have to perform miracles. You don't have to live forever. You don't have to be supernatural. Just attain what you truly are. This is it. And the transmission of this goes from mind to mind. It cannot be transmitted like an object from one person to another. It does not depend on culture or ceremony. It's all within the context of cultures and it's all performed by ceremonies when it becomes formal. But the actual transmission is directly from mind to mind. These are the four principles of Zen. So as you see, the teaching on like this or just like this and the four principles of Zen and the three kinds of energy, they are closely connected. In fact, it's like the three sides of the same object. So if you want to go into the path, you do not have to learn more. In fact, you would have to forget most of what you have considered absolute or the cognitive foundation or the emotional patterns of life. You would have to let go of that and actually tolerate seeing your karma. Tolerate that you're not perfect. That you're not the most beautiful or the most clever or the strongest, etc., etc., that we want even as early 20 agers. So that's why going on the path is being disillusioned. Disillusioned and disappointed, it's not being depressed. It's becoming awake, becoming aware. And out of this disillusionment and sometimes disappointment comes this oneness experience. We never should forget that. And that's what gives you strength. That's what makes you sort of self-powered. Not ego-powered, self-powered. So I think uh, this is plenty for introductory. And now I would like you to <coughs> ask your questions using uh, the wonderful technology of a microphone. I, uh, for me it's not clear the third type of energy Okay, the third type of energy is Kongi, breathing. We call it empty energy. Kong, like gong, means literally empty. So empty energy, that's your breath, because it has no content. And that breath is what connects you to the world, because it brings your mind and body together to this same moment. You're welcome. More questions? Any kind of question. So everything's perfect. Everybody's fine. You have no issues to resolve. Oh, wonderful. Go ahead. I want to ask, uh, how do you deal with the attachment of your suffering? Let's say that you're attached to the things you've been through, your negative thoughts, and it's hard for you to let go. So how do you deal with that? Uh, first, you realize how selfish it is of you to attach to your own suffering. So if you notice how selfish that is, it doesn't serve anybody except you, then it's easier to let go of it. And also, you can see that it doesn't help anybody if you're attached to your suffering. Also, if you try to avert it, if you try to hide, if you try to escape, that also doesn't help. So without being attached to it, how do you use your suffering to help yourself and all beings? That's the question. And the only way is to wake up, see the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to end suffering. Because the fact of suffering is not enough. Correct relationship also necessary. If you don't see the other three of the four noble truths, you cannot do that. And now, since we are adults, I have to add a fifth important part of this cycle, which is correctly choosing your suffering. Choose your suffering correctly. How does that happen? Something which helps all beings, not just you. So choose your suffering correctly. Because if it only serves you, it's not correct. It has to serve all beings and all people. And suffering many times is something that blindfolds us. Awakening makes us clear. And then sometimes, but not all the time, 
what we thought of as suffering stops being suffering. It becomes just as it is, cause and effect. We grow up, we get old, we die. If I look at it from a selfish point of view, this is full of suffering. If you're not selfish, it just happens with your active participation, but it just happens. Take the notion of self out of it, it will disappear. And cause and effect remains. It doesn't turn you into a machine. In fact, you will be even more authentic as a human being. Because you don't have the filters of your own notion of self. I would like to ask, um, we can attain these states of oneness through various techniques and uh, substances and sounds. And, um, but what I didn't talk about substances. You um, do. Yeah, um, but this is not the point of the question. I want to say we can attain these states of oneness, which are beautiful. And um, wait until you get there. May not be beautiful. Uh, well, I believe I had a couple of these experiences, and there's a frustration creeping in whenever you can't come back. There's like this plateau, and you feel like in your brain you realize that um, those states of oneness are maybe home or something like that, and it feels very much like home, and then. You, I at least ask myself. You mean myself, home as a house with a door and a parking lot? Yeah, no, more. Like, <laughs> no, more like home. That's where you, we belong in that state of oneness. Okay. And um, then, whenever you come back and re-identify yourself with the I, you start re-experiencing this world of pain and suffering and all that. And then the question is, whether do we? take this decision consciously of coming back? No, you take the decision consciously to have an opinion on this state of mind. And that's when you lose it. So, originally, there's no coming, no going. In your question, there's a critical part. You say, when we come back, we never go anywhere. So we don't come back. But we start to think about the unthinkable. We start to qualify something which cannot be qualified. We start to lose this energy level or oneness and that's when we start to follow it with your thinking, with your emotions and we want to get it back by riding a bicycle although we used to be on a rocket. No matter how much you ride the bicycle, you cannot get back to the rocket. So that's when you have to stop and find your own rocket on which you are already sitting. Because the bicycle never works. Bicycle is good for these local trips, or around Europe, or on another continent. It's great, but it will never get you an orbit. Okay? So do not think about these states of mind. Let go of your thinking, then your thinking goes away, and this oneness remains. Your arm is good in one piece. Don't chop it up with your cognition. Okay? So there is no going back or going there, but there is oneness and then going into 10,000 pieces. The point is not really just attaining these things, attaining these states of mind. The point is really beyond attainment how to keep that. And that takes practice. These days, in the last 30-40 years, people wanted to find the easy way up. And usually it took some booster, some substance. And there's nothing wrong with these substances as long as you don't become dependent on them and you don't have false ideas about them. These two are the killers. You become dependent and you have the wrong idea. Then you make the wrong decision. So people believed just by taking some magic mushroom or pill or some chemical, they could stay enlightened. Even the experience was chemically heavily influenced. But some chemicals, LSD, DMT and all these things, they were geared towards this. They were made to have these experiences. And uh, people couldn't stay there. You know how easy it would be? Everybody would get 
the pill of enlightened consciousness, you would just have to take it every day and everything's fine. All anger, desire and ignorance from the world is gone. No more greed, no more suffering, no more misplaced identity. Well, ladies and gentlemen, everybody in this room knows that such pill, such substance does not exist. But my question is uh, about Buddha nature. Can you a little, little bit? I'm not very familiar with this concept. When you hear this sound and you have no thinking, no I, your Buddha nature functions 100%. Because you just see, just hear, just taste, smell, touch, think, feel, all of it clearly, without a second thought, without any dualistic ideas. So what is it that perceives all of this? I cannot tell you, but that's what hears what I am saying right now. You can experience it, but you can never define it. It is never born, it never dies, it is not high, not low, neither good nor bad, neither here nor there. Everybody has the same amount of it. But you should understand that Buddha nature, as empty and complete as it is, together, empty and complete, it's a concept. Originally, this concept does not exist. Don't hold on to it. You will never find Buddha nature in a kind of special jar, like the Holy Grail, and then you can drink that essence every day. The sixth patriarch, Hui Neng, was a very, very unusual and outstanding, extraordinary person. He was born into a very poor family. He grew up illiterate. The father was gone very early. And when he turned 17, 18, he heard a monk recite the Diamond Sutra in the marketplace and instantly woke up and asked the monk, where you practice, my elder brother? So he goes to the fifth patriarch's place and uh, he was still an apprentice in Korean Hengja, not yet a monk, when there was a poetry contest for all the monks to demonstrate their dharma. The fifth patriarch ordered this because he wanted to give transmission. And the head monk, Shen Siu, he wrote a four-liner on the wall of the monastery which went like this. The body is Bodhi tree. The mind is clear mirrors stand. Always clean, clean, clean. Never let dust settle. Now, this reflects the view of most of us that doesn't like uh, any convoluted transcendental ideas, but we want something clear. So we resort to Buddha nature or enlightenment nature. But even that is an idea, although it's empty and complete in this way. But the sixth patriarch, who was just no Hengja at that time, he asked one of the monks to read these characters out to him because he couldn't read and write. So he hears that and he says, hmm, maybe there's something else that should be written on that wall. Could you please help me, elder brother? And they looked at him and said, what? You're not even a monk. What are you talking about? He said, please, please, please. Due to the grace of the fifth patriarch, this contest is open for everybody. Then he says, Bodhi has no tree. Clear mirror has no stand. Originally nothing. Where is dust? He won the contest. Another story just to give you another angle, because everybody wants to understand, but we do not easily accept the fact that we cannot understand it, only attain it or experience it. Long time ago in Tang Dynasty, a few centuries after Hui Neng, uh, they asked them, Master Ma Zhou, mind and Buddha, are they the same or are they different? Then he says, mind is Buddha, Buddha is mind. And everybody, very happy, no problem, mind is Buddha, Buddha is mind. Everybody is enlightened, great. So then, some time passes and they ask him again, Master, please, mind and Buddha, are they the same or different? He says, no mind, no Buddha. Then everybody was shocked. This is, Master, Master, why do you say that? Just a little earlier you said, 
Mind is Buddha, Buddha is mind. Why did you say that? He says, so that the children wouldn't cry at night. So how do we wake up from this immense dependence on this, this little conceptual reality? So it is not absolute. We make this. So return to this point and see that the floor is gray. That's how your Buddha nature works. That's how it functions. What is karma in Buddhism? What is karma not in Buddhism? What do you consider karma to be? Wonderful. Action and result. The repetition of action and result. The habits based on the repetitions of action and result. The identity formed based on the habits of the repetitions of action and result. Now this identity is what we call self. I have asked this question because I wanted to get to another question. Um, <laughs> Bad karma. Ask that question directly. Go ahead. Reincarnations are simultaneous. Who said that? Since time does not exist just for time only exists for us. Wrong. It exists for all beings depending on their minds and bodies. We experience time in the specific way humans do. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so don't say time exists. Don't say time does not exist. We have a specific way to experience time. And that's how we operate as human beings. So it's very, very true that time and space are relative. And you don't need Einstein for that. Great respects to him. But you need to have your own experience how time as a notion arises and goes away. Time for us in its linear fashion. If you say it exists, you make a mistake. If you say it doesn't exist, you also make a mistake. How, how do we apply in the real, real life when people around us are maybe negative, maybe someone positive, uh, all the time people say, push them away, push them away. I'm, I'm not like that and I don't want to think like that. How we manage to, uh, to live by people that think negative, maybe act wrong or bad, how we move in life, keeping them around us, but uh, don't, uh, don't transform us. So we always talk about this original nature of ours, uh, which is characterized as clear like space, clear like a mirror. This is not a figure of speech. So when people are either positive or negative for you, then the first thing is to see them truly like in a mirror. And as I have said earlier, then the positive and negative judgment about it will disappear. You will see them truly as they are in their true relationship of cause and effect. How does that happen? You stop fooling yourself. Don't have any more ideas of good and bad, these rosy dreams, these very bad scenarios, you know, uh, happy day, bad day, doomsday, apocalypse, uh, heavenly judgment. We all have that conditioned within us. So put that all down. See those people truly for what they are, who they are. Hear their speech, feel their feelings, think their thoughts. Become one with their action. It's very, very difficult because you want to Defend yourself, preserve yourself, separate yourself. That's what you term this pushing them away, which is a usual reaction. Now you can discover many things. As long as you have positive or negative attitude towards these people, they will keep coming. They will keep coming because you have positive and negative, so these attractions, they, they keep working. Can you hit space? Does space attract or push things away. So if your mind is really clear like space, clear like a mirror, you perceive your own thoughts in the same way as theirs, your feelings as theirs. So what you really need to do, become this clear like space, clear like mirror mind. And I know it's easier said than done, but I'm just setting the direction and we walk the distance together. So moment to moment, become clear, moment to moment, see them, perceive them. And when your mind doesn't move, doesn't create right and wrong, doesn't create positive, negative, you perceive cause and effect in such a way that at some point you will be able to help them. 
you will be able to help them first and foremost by a non-judgmental mind. And they will feel that you have loving kindness and compassion. And this clear like space, clear like mirror consciousness can save you. Because sometimes we have to work in environments that are truly hostile, that are destructive, that would recondition us into someone we don't want to be. How do you prevent that from happening? Well, first, like I said, you have to see yourself, your own notion of identity as is, then their karma as is, and then you can have a very firm and clear moment of this suchness or thusness. And then you can set your path very clearly, which does not depend on them. It may be connected to them, but it doesn't depend on them. Growing up as a human being has many stages, but many grown-ups are still like children inside. So when you are mentally and physically both grown up, then you do not depend, you don't judge, you don't make, you don't hold, you don't attach, and then your path becomes clear, and then you can really help other people. But how can we use our mind that is educated to be dualistic, good, bad, I don't know what, for decades? Okay. We were educated like Decades, this. such an understatement. <laughs> Lifetimes. <laughs> okay. Lifetime. Good. And so, suddenly, with the same mind, not, not to judge or uh, to take it like it is, okay. as it is. How you, can we... You have a kitchen, right? Yes. <laughs> you have knives in the kitchen, right? Like Small everybody. knife, big knife, sharp knife, blunt knife all kinds of knives, right? We all do. Yes. So how do you use those knives correctly? Obviously, when you have some vegetables to chop, you use those knives, but you don't take the same knife to the bedroom. Your husband would be very, very unpleasantly surprised. I generally don't take any knife Good. in my bedroom. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> So use your conceptual thinking wherever it has its own function, but don't use it in places where it has no correct function. So realizing your situation, relationship and function, this is very, very important. So use your conceptual thought where it has correct function and don't use it where it doesn't. Have you ever tried to define the term love? Oh, yes. Did it work? No. And did you stop doing that? Till now, no. So why not recognize that the intellectual definition of love will never work? But you can always hug your husband and care for your children. I'm saying that define the definable and don't try to define the undefinable. Cut the vegetables, but don't use the knife in an argument. Correctly recognizing your own situation your own relationship and your own function is a key to the path. And that's why we have to have this clear like space, clear like mirror consciousness. Use your mind where it has a job. Don't use the mind where it doesn't have a job. I'm curious, <laughs> do you have experience meeting children in it during your sitting meditations? And another question. Hey, uh, do you think I'll remember the first? So, uh, you mean meeting children in, in the Dharma room? Yes, did you ever, I don't know... Have we, have, we have couples who came to meditation and we let the children kind of run around, especially during chanting. And uh, that's so sweet. Oh, it's so wonderful. And during sitting, if the child can uh, keep quiet, then they can rest Yes, in. or practice, even practice meditation. Of course, did but you? under age 8, 9, they usually can't sit. It's very rare. I met like a 6-year-old boy super absolutely focused but uh, we had couples with daughters uh, of age eight nine both of them set very straight and very clear fantastic so yeah children can come to zen practice and they can be doing very well instinctively but as they become adolescents and teenagers they lose it they have to reattain it because they are not fully grown individuals. So when they turn teenagers and time goes on and hormones begin to flow and your notion of self changes, your whole sensory perception changes, uh, everything, everything, almost everything is gone. They will have it as a memory. 
if, uh, if they solved congas, they usually forget the answers. And they, they have to reattain. That's why one of the greatest bodhisattvas on earth said, and yet I tell you that if you do not become children again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So, become children again. You cannot stay a child. You cannot pretend to be a child. You have to grow up into these ugly adults that we all are, and then become children again with the innocence, with the clarity, with the purity, and all those attributes that is defined in here. So children are great. They can come. In fact, we don't limit them. If they are noisy, then the parents usually take them you know, out of the Dharma room. But during chanting, especially with the rhythmic sound of the moktak, uh, some of them dance a little bit. Then they don't draw too much attention, but everybody smiles. So then they go back to mommy or daddy, look up to them, did you see me dance, you know? And then of course they get their little pet and hug and whatever, so they feel totally safe and uh, accommodated. And what is amazing about children that they truly feel the compassionate energy of the mantras. We have to chant because we have so much thinking up here, but those kids, they just feel your heart. And when so many hearts are joined with the same chanting and we vibe, you know, together, and they feel just totally and absolutely loved. When they are very little, like two, three years old, they fall asleep and they sleep through the chanting. And uh, we never had anything un unpleasant with them during practice. So that's how it works. It's beautiful. Do you think that would it be beneficial to introduce meditation in schools? I'm just wondering, it's a curiosity of mine. I would be super cautious, you know, about meditation because in this part of the world, Eastern Europe, we, we have uh, small countries with a big sense of insecurity, culturally and in many other ways. So if you wanted to introduce meditation, there are ways to do that. You include that in uh, games, in games you, you play. So that's what we call active or externalized meditation. And children love that. School kids love that. And if you want to be more focused, then you can introduce meditation as attention development exercise. And there's a clinical reason for that. You know, ADD or attention deficit disorder. I don't believe in it. Yeah, uh, it doesn't really exist as an independent you know, syndrome, but it has components that are actually observable in children who use too many things online, eat junk food, uh, these kids. Uh, they actually cannot pay attention, but it's not like having some viral sickness. So meditation can be introduced and should be introduced in schools as a tool to improve your learning capabilities. And next level is problem solving. Problem solving can be uh, greatly enhanced by what we call interactive meditation. You have two people who really hate each other sit in the same room. And you don't talk, you don't move, you don't look, you don't touch, you sit in the same room. That's the first half an hour. And then slowly, slowly, you begin to interact with questions. You don't state anything about the other, you don't make any opinions, you don't voice any of your emotions, but you ask questions from the other one at a time. This is like deeper problem solving. It can be applied in so many ways. But I would not put Buddhist meditation or Zen meditation over there. I would develop the kind of meditation that is not culturally alien or religiously different. And I would call that applied mind practice. In some companies where they want to increase profit, they realize that if the minds are clearer, they can connect better, work better, do everything better because they make less mistakes. They see better. They perceive more accurately. So then they, they do that kind of uh, group training where they enhance the mental capabilities of the participants. And that's also perfectly okay. We just shouldn't mistake it for the path towards awakening because it's different. It's applied meditation, not this objectless mind just going straight through, discarding all illusions, totally becoming free from any sensory attachments, etc. Et that's the kind of ultimate. Now, you don't have to use this always in the ultimate sense. You can apply it in children's care, in schools, 
for treating uh, various disorders, reducing stress, building better teams. So this application is not untrue to the original principle. It's just the application in a closed and defined environment. If you don't touch the culture and the religion and the identities of a given country, you can do this usually pain-free. But it will always get into the walls of their own attachments or ideas, etc. And then you have to be patient and compassionate. Otherwise, you degrade the path and the technique and yourself into something you don't want to be. Okay, so there's great space for that. And I hope most of us in this lifetime will experience a pattern change where we develop quality consciousness. If we do not develop this quality consciousness, we will repeat the same mistakes as a society and family and individual over and over again in the same way as we have done that for centuries. What helps me to see my real motivations? You sit down and you ask yourself this question, what do I really want? And be patient. The film will appear. We have so many layers of willpower. Sometimes we are so confused that focusing on this question, what do I really want, is not selfish. It has a clarifying effect. So, what is it that you truly, really want? And then some hierarchy will appear. You want this first, that next, that one last. Then your true motivation can come by applying this question, where does this come from? You already see what you want. And then you ask, where does this come from? And then all the relationship patterns will appear. So first, this very, very short focus appears on one single object. This object of mind is what you want. And then you open up the focus by asking, where does this come from? And all the relationships appear. And remember, this is not analysis. This is enhanced perception. You don't think do doing this. You don't apply emotional or cognitive patterns while doing this. You only perceive. You don't touch the movie. The movie will reveal itself. And then don't judge yourself because you have actually seen your true motivations. You can change that. And only in the way that you don't judge it, but you replace certain motivations with others. And when you have done that, you can kind of recompile this whole willpower package and do things differently. I have a difficult question because uh, my question is how we can practice our compassion towards a rapist or a criminal? You want to use the finest medicine for the worst of the sicknesses. Yeah, some kind. And be patient with that and use what needs to be used first. And what needs to be used first is wisdom. And that's what most of these penitentiaries don't have. They lock people up because they want to protect society from these perpetrators, which is a rightful action, but it's not enough. First, you have to give them some teaching on cause and effect because they most of the time don't see what they have done, but they have the motivation to do it again because it gives them the thrill, the effect, the power, the satisfaction. And it's not helpful if you just say that these are aberrated consciousnesses. These are distorted people. These are monsters. Even so, that they do the unforgivable. They do something which is a heinous crime. You cannot heal them or help them just by labeling them. But the opposite is also not effective, that you just apply unconditional wisdom and compassion, and then you expect that to work. It's like the opposite of brute force. It's very weak. So first of all, you have to start where they are at. If they have no question about their own situation, then don't teach them. That's number one. If they don't want to know, they will develop a resistance towards what you're about to say. So start where they are. Answer the questions about their own selfish interests and try to expand their view of consciousness and the view of karma sufficiently that they could see some basic cause and effect. Then comes the hardest part. Look at emotional cause and effect and start with them, themselves. What is it that makes you feel bad? What is it that makes you feel good? 
What is it that makes your cellmate feel good or your cellmate feel so bad that he wants to hit you? And then this education progresses and progresses and progresses and then you come to the victim. That's the next step and it takes years to get through that. And then some compassion can appear and some purification can appear. It takes a lot of uh, concentration, a lot of conversation, a lot of practice, everything that uh, we could use from Western and Eastern practices uh, to open up that mind and enlighten that mind. So this also shows us the immense amount of human ignorance that we have piled up on both sides. Both sides. We don't know what to do with this karma. So the only way to overcome that is to first look at that, see the causes, apply some wisdom, have some compassion, and it takes years. That's why, from my point of view, the death sentence is a total waste of an incarnation. You have to keep them going on the path of realization as long as possible. In fact, if I had a medicine to grant long life, I would use it on these inmates first. You should live until the very end of your life, 80, 100, 120, with a super clear mind and face what you've done every single day and talk about it if you wish or process it, but you cannot hide, you cannot escape, you cannot just get out of the body and die and carry this over to your next incarnation. Why shouldn't we know the previous karmas? Many reasons. Uh, what you need to see comes up from your subconscious and manifests in your life. So that's plenty already. Most of the time we cannot deal with even what we see, even what comes up. Now we even want to see more. So there are these many ways to take journeys into previous lives or to see the depth of your subconscious, etc. And of course, I never say do it or don't do it, just be aware of the consequences. What you see is something you'll have to deal with. You'll have to do something about it. This is not just a journey in Disneyland. It touches your identity. And the reason why we don't remember by default our previous lives is that we would not go bonkers. Imagine that you would remember your previous lives' identities with the same intensity as you have your own character right now. So who are you? You couldn't decide because the same strength of experience would be valid for this lifetime, the previous one, two lives before, three, four, five, etc. What we need to know, we know. But we do everything that we have to do. But we don't know what we know. 95% <laughs> of your carried personality is subconscious. 5 to 10% is conscious for a good reason. So Zen practice doesn't make you travel back into previous lives. If you have any flashbacks, it's a side effect. And it comes and it goes, you become aware of it, and you can just get over it. But what is superbly clear, that the threshold between conscious and subconscious will become manageable and transparent. So when you do mantra practice, your cognition doesn't move, your heart doesn't form intentional emotions, so the mantra goes into your subconscious. And you do that for a very, very long time, and suddenly something changes. You don't know what it is. But your mind has transformed itself subconsciously by the effect of the mantra. It does the same thing with advertisements, linguistic suggestions. If you get insufficient information from your subconscious because you repress the content, we do it all the time, then your life is incomplete, you're isolated from your karma. This kind of repression comes back with a vengeance. We call it explosion or implosion. So something external touches you and then your consciousness explodes because you haven't managed your homework for a long time. It's like gas accumulating in a small chamber. Or implosion because you created a kind of emptiness, a cavity, and then something, then you cave in. What Zen practice does very spontaneously, that what you need to see as coming up from your subconscious and what you need to put down there back to your subconscious becomes spontaneous and simple and clear. 
The result is that you do not have more thoughts than you need to. But the amount of thoughts you need to have, you have that. Emotions, the same. You're not overflown by emotions because it would be too much. But you're not without emotions when you need them. So very spontaneous and clear interaction between conscious and subconscious respecting the borders. It's correct to have a border between conscious and subconscious. But it has to be transparent and it has to be accessible and you have to get through back and forth. So we should be aware of the fact that just like we don't see 95% of the universe, we don't see 95% of ourselves by default. To that extent, we are unpredictable. And that's a very large extent. Your rational consciousness is sitting on top of you, trying to prepare the next move and somehow being logical and consequential and coherent about it. Then something emotional comes up, everything disappears and you do the stupidest thing in your life. But with the same impulse, you can do the greatest thing in your life. In the same way, you get creative you know, flashes and you, you become an inventor or the next Einstein. Zen practice makes this process very clear, very spontaneous, and what's most important, directed towards a clear purpose, whether it's applied or just done on the path to awakening. So this kind of direction is most important. Sung San Sunim said, direction, direction, direction. That's all that matters, because that's how you apply your willpower. That's how you understand karma. That's how you can be compassionate when you have to be. If this direction is not clear, you just keep repeating things over and over again. In Korean, this is called one hang dong or circular action. It's like a dog chasing its own tail or a snake biting its own tail. So how do you go straight? How do you become free? How do you wake up? How do you help all beings? If you practice, you attain these answers, but no matter how much you think, that thinking will not give you sufficient response. So I hope all of us in this room will enter the path of correct meditation and awakening so that we could all attain enlightenment and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much for your attention.